California broad tests history of endless growth running against the limits of nature. In the, um, in the upper Indus Valley, they are also running against the limit, not of growth, but of life. Farmers, well, well off farmers, pump from the aquifer as much water as they can. Whatever of aquifer goes down in such a way that poorer farms have no pumps and so cannot make use of the subsidies of the state. They just run out of water because there is no water left in the traditional wells. <coughs> it's not only water, soil. In Europe and in the United States, the farmers put between 200 and 220 kilos of nitrates, chemical nitrates a year per hectare. And plants use about 20% of that quantity. And you know where the rest goes. In China, it's worse. It's, the quantities are greater because Chinese farmers and Chinese advisors to farmers think that the more nitrates you put in the soil, the better it is. But nitrates and excess, they go to water, they go to air, and they also remain in the soil. And when, remain in, when they remain in the soil in a large excess, what happens? It happens that the soil acidifies, and when the acidification is advanced, then a compound of aluminium is solubilized, which is a serious toxin against the plant. In a recent report by the official authorities in Beijing, they warned that they were on the way of destroying 20% of Arab soil by erosion and by acidification. For a country which lacks Arab soil, it's dangerous. And oceans. There is a proverbial saying in France, well, not saying, interjection. Uh, you are at dinner with your kids, and uh, the kids are not very enthusiastic about eating their soup. And so the father said, Toto, mange ta soup. Eat your soup. No longer. Right to well-known oceanographers, one Canadian, one French. They have published two years ago a book which is considered for translation at, uh, at uh, Columbia University Press. And the title of the book is Mange des Méduses, Eat Your Shadows. Jellyfish. Sorry. Eat Your Jellyfish. And indeed, at the pace of degradation in the oceans, the remaining biodiversity might be someday the variety of jellyfish in the world. My colleagues will show that other ways are possible. Other ways are possible which don't degrade squander the national capital, but instead use it along with science, with good management, as efficiently as possible. And before I stop talking, I will quickly give myself an example of what can be done when there is an alliance between nature, science and technology, and good management. In a very poor part of India, in the state of Bihar, Bihar, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, which is a state next to Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in the Indian Federation, and also around the world. And of course, in these places, 
in the rural parts of these states, there is no electricity available. Two Indian engineers, both in electrical engineering, engineering both from Rensselaer Polytechnic, Troy, and two managers, both for the Virginia, the Virginia Business School, all four from either Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, had good jobs, good salaries in this country uh, for what they came to consider as futile tasks and they thought of going back to do something more useful. The main idea was provide electricity for rural communities at affordable cost using local resources, both natural and human. They first tried photovoltaic, which didn't meet this criteria exactly, and uh, it was a success. And then one of the electrical engineers, the, I would say the leader of the group, he thought of, well, he was from there, he was from a poor family, he struggled to, to uh, make uh, his own work uh, in the evenings after school because he had no right. Uh, and he, he very well knew the people and also the characteristics of the landscape and of the local economy. And so he, he thought of the heaps of hush which litter the landscape in these states, which are, of course, large producers of mice. And the hush can't do much with that. It doesn't have nutrients, so you cannot give it back to the earth. It doesn't <coughs> directly uh, give you easy energy. So we thought, here is a resource, abundant, non-used. So if I find a use for it, I will not compete with other uses, especially with food production. He developed a technique, gasification of the hush, which has good properties for that and then using the gas uh, to produce electricity. And he was not an engineer who loves maximum sophistication. Uh, he was uh, an engineer convinced that wisdom is in Einstein rule. Einstein rule is as simple as possible, but no simpler. So he devised power plants, simple but effective, power plant of, oh, of course, a very modest size, maybe 40 kilowatt of power plant, uh, using maybe 50 kilos an hour of push, which was almost for nothing, and serving a community of uh, maybe uh, 4,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, individuals, serving meaning, meaning electricity for one light, for recharging telephone, and also for the local modest businesses which needed uh, and which replaced their, their waste, their, 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 their wasteful use of uh, gasoline uh, to produce electricity to just go in taking care of these plants. Not Modest grids, of course, those local grids on bamboo pools uh, going to the various uh, consumers. Low prices. Running is 15 cents a kilowatt. Investing 
is paid by the Indian government, but anyway, it's not large sums. It's also paid by a few Western institutions, like the Shell Foundation and like Alstom Foundation, Alstom being the producer of the electric equipment in France, which has recently merged with General Electric. And that's the way I got aware of this experiment. Last interesting point, they created what they proudly called Ash Power System University, which in German I would call a technische Schule. Uh, there they educate open minded but not previously educated young people in the, in the communities. They educate, they form what they call plants, junior mechanics, one for each plant. And they form also senior mechanic or middle managers, supervising maybe 10 plants and uh, getting in only if at the level of a plant a problem cannot be solved. Local human resources, promoting local talents, jobs, electricity at last in these communities, dreamed of, have dreamed of for decades. This is an example of what can bring, and we will have other examples. An alliance of nature, imagination in making use of science and technology, enhancement of people capacity, program management. An alliance that mankind might come to bitter regret not to have enough calculated. Because we should remember, we should remember Martin Luther King in an address made at Riverside Church of here in 67. We are faced now by the fact that tomorrow is today. On the bleached bones and jungle residues of numerous civilization are written the, path the pathetic words too late. Not yet too late. And uh, so I'm going to focus on some unfashionable natural capital, that is to say, non-renewable resources, uh, sort of traditional nat natural capital, if you like, and then on, on renewable resources and, and basically just the global thermostat. And so in order to do this, I'm going to restrict my discussion to fossil fuels and global warming, and very, very end up may mention a few other commodities. So, this initial slide I'm using comes from this great uh, Scientific American article by Rob Sokolow and Steve Pakala. And uh, I don't think it's meant to be funny. Uh, but on the left side here, you see the horrible, gloomy situation into which we seem to be inexorably heading. It's raining a great deal. I'm not sure why. But you can see the sea level is rising. And they have to protect the city from the rising sea and there's various poisons and there's a terrible traffic jam <coughs> on the bridge and all the smokestacks in the back. And then on the other side, this is a world that we could have where everybody's riding public transportation and walking and there's solar panels along the shore and people are sharing more walls and these beautiful skyscrapers. So if this is such an obvious choice, how come we're having so much trouble making it? So I want to start uh, with this slide, so uh, I saw a presentation by this man Saul Griffith many years ago. And I'm using this slide here to make it a little bit out of date, but he, uh, he said he had the flu for several weeks. He's kind of a boy genius software type guy. Uh, he had the flu for several weeks and he wrote a book. And uh, so in his book, you find this uh, uh, slide, uh, average per person power use in months versus population in millions. Uh, and so, uh, 
in Asia, excluding the Middle East, 14, the per capita use is 1,450 watts. Uh, in North America, it's 11,400 watts. And the average states data, you find that the average per capita use of energy today is 2,250 watts. And Saul said that the last time that, well, let's guess. Who would like to guess when the last time uh, European people, this is a hint, uh, living on the east coast of North America, uh, we're using 2,250 watts per person. 1750. So Saul said this. I didn't believe it. I went and got the data. So here's uh, U.S. population in red and uh, U.S. Uh, power consumption in blue. And then the quotient per capita power consumption units on the right-hand axis in purple. See that the last time uh, people in Eastern North America were using 2,250 watts per person was in 1750. So the point of showing you this is to elicit your agreement that none of us really would be willing to return to that per capita energy consumption. And indeed, uh, if you look at the, if you look at the developed world. Uh, Per capita energy consumption is gradually falling a tiny bit on this logarithmic scale. I don't know the amounts of but it's decreasing a little bit. Whereas in the developing world, China and India, as a representation here, the growth rates in per capita energy consumption are very, very large. And it's easy to understand that. Uh, less than half the households in China have refrigeration. And uh, I don't know what the fraction is, but many households as uh, Professor Omi was alluding to, many households in India don't have any electricity at all. And so it's clear that uh, these people uh, desire to uh, at least get to, let's say, European uh, levels of per capita energy consumption, and they will probably do what they can do to succeed in that effort. Another kind of astonishing plot. Here's, uh, this, this is the last figure in this wonderful book by Vaclav Smil, called Energy at the Crossroads. Beginning to be a tiny bit out of that day now, but energy use in hectajoules per year, here I change it to billions of tons of oil equivalent per year, uh, versus time. And you can see from these data that there's about a tenfold increase in energy consumption globally uh, in the previous <coughs> century. And uh, if this were to continue, uh, it seems pretty likely to me that would involve a tenfold increase or more in energy consumption this century, which seems inconceivable. If you think about the scale of the oil industry, the scale of the electrical power generation industry in the world today, and imagine that becoming ten times larger. It's just almost impossible to grasp, but I'm sure at the turn of the previous century, people found it equally inconceivable that energy use could rise by a factor of 10 in the century, but it did. Okay, so things may be slowing down a little bit. I've just updated this plot, converted to loads of tons of oil equivalent. I updated this with some data from BP, which shows maybe the growth rate is decelerating from almost 3% per year to a little bit more than 2% per year. But, but not, uh, it's a short time series. It's not clear where we're at. So uh, if we take data on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, going back to 1750, again, this logarithmic vertical scale of linear time, so that a line on this diagram is exponential growth. You see a basically exponential growth in uh, carbon dioxide emissions. This is just a fit to the data from Bob Mill, as though all of the energy consumption is generated by burning fossil fuels. Since about uh, 1875, those two fits agree very well because it's true that almost all energy generation comes from burning fossil fuels. And that's continuing to the present day. But then this very beautiful fit of cumulative uh, carbon emissions versus CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So if we continue along this exponential trend, of increasing uh, energy consumption, 
and that is done using primarily using fossil fuels, then we will see this corresponding increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. This is sort of a global warming for people who don't believe models. And so uh, now this is a linear plot, the same thing, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere versus time. It's exponential increase because emissions are increasing exponentially. We predict a doubling in 50 years and caveats that this is if we continue to increase our energy consumption at 2 or 3% a year. So the black dots here are from the famous paper by uh, Wally Broker. Uh, 1976, we predicted this very well, and then uh, here's the data on warming since 1900. Uh, those of you who've ever made such a plot will know that choosing the denominator uh, makes a big difference in these plots. We don't maybe focus on the absolute numbers, but uh, so here's the, the data on warming since 1900. And these two curves, the blue curve is for a so-called climate sensitivity of one and a half degrees for doubling of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And the red curve is for 6.2 degrees of temperature increase for doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere. These are physics-based estimates, not model-based estimates. And you see the data are sort of falling between these two things. And again, while these prediction is really better than any model prediction today, because of some empirical factors, he said, well, there is this oscillation in the North Atlantic temperature. We don't really understand it by now. And so he, he uh, so far, looks really good in terms of predicting what's happening. And again, this is a logarithmic scale, but this would predict you know, at least two degrees of warming uh, by 20. So moving uh, to kind of Capital. Uh, we have this new, or relatively new concept of stranded assets that I'd like to introduce to you. It comes from an organization called Carbon Tracker. It's on studies sponsored by the Grant Institute. I've just kind of reframed data that maybe a lot of people knew already. Um, I'm going to take these numbers quite as seriously as some people do, but they came up with the idea that in order to avoid uh, in order to keep the risk of exceeding two degrees of warming below 1%, uh, we can only emit uh, 240 gigatons of carbon in this century. And uh, we've already emitted uh, 150 gigatons of carbon in this century. Sorry, we've already emitted, sorry, about 90 gigatons of carbon in this century, so that leaves a balance of 150 gigatons that we can emit. By contrast, the identified fossil fuel reserves, the term reserve, in theory, refers to identified uh, resources that are economically extractable at present day prices. Uh, 780 gigatons of carbon. The uh, carbon tracker thinks that's worth about $27 trillion in capital, in stock, in oil companies, and corresponding uh, investment in sovereign wealth funds, which actually own about 83% of all of these reserves. I have some question marks here, and I'll show you in a minute. I'm not really sure exactly what this means. But in any case, uh, if you can only afford to earn 154 gigatons or emit no more 154 gigatons more, you divide that by the size of the reserves, come up with a value, 20% of the identified fossil fuel reserves um, can be burned, and the other 80% if we're going to stay below 2 degrees C of warming should stay in the ground. This corresponds to about $20 trillion in investments if the total reserves are worth $27 trillion, and about a quarter of current global GDP. So I read an article in The Nation about a year and a half ago saying this is really a dramatic reallocation of resources. That the last time that we tried, or that people uh, by some legal mechanism attempted to reallocate uh, a quarter of uh, investment resources, or 20% of investment resources, 
And the author said, I don't mean to uh, get into the moral issues here, but the last and only historical example that I can think of where such a large transfer of capital was requested and ultimately enacted was the Emancipation Proclamation. And that uh, to deprive uh, the fossil fuel industry of this giant amount of investment is to ask for a really uh, grand scale reallocation of resources on the scale of taking away uh, slavery from the southern states. Anyway, but if we extended this reallocation of capital over 10 years, it would be 2.5% of GDP per year. And we'll take a look at what that number might mean. The reason I'm a little confused about the market value is let's just take oil, although we call this an, on, uh, a non-renewable resource, and it surely is. The fact is that identified reserves have been growing throughout all of our lifetimes, um, and that's because of complicated nonlinear interaction with the price. Uh, so if you just multiply the reserves by the price, you see that the price has increased phenomenal. So the sort of street value, let's pretend oil is heroin, the street value of, of heroin, of what? I mean, has steadily gone up and is, is pushing uh, $200 trillion or several multiples of GDP uh, right now. So what is this really worth? I'm not sure. It's worth an awful lot. So here's cumulative carbon emissions in gigatons. Here's the data that I've showed you in various different formats already. Time, linear time, logarithmic scale, this is exponential growth. This is 3% per year. That's 2.5% per year. And this is the uh, limit that I've interpreted that comes from IPCC about total cumulative emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that is permissible in order to maintain the climate within a uh, two degree C of warming. And I said, okay, I don't think they know within a factor of two, but it doesn't look like much on this diagram because of the magic of exponential growth. And so what you see is that uh, it's really pretty likely that um, we may go through these limits Regardless of whether you like the lower bound, I used to say, or the upper bound, which is just multiplying their estimate by two uh, before mid century. And just recasting this, putting the time value out of here, here's CO2 in the atmosphere, somewhere between 450 and 550 is probably getting to be too high. And then this is the stranded assets that. Result, uh, roughly uh, three quarters of the identified reserves, and remarkably, or not remarkably, perhaps inevitably and not surprisingly, the oil, gas, and indeed coal industries continue to explore for additional resources. They've been quite successful in doing so, and so uh, because this exploration continues, uh, the stranded assets. So how bad is this? And uh, of course, uh, some people would say that uh, unrestrained global warming on the scale that I just showed you, supposing we end up <coughs> here, uh, could be the end of civilization. You have the humans on the planet and so on. Extremely difficult to assign cost to that. But the White House and other people have bravely tried, and this is the so-called social cost of carbon, uh, estimates from the US, really a White House consortium, um, but the, led by the EPA. Complicated diagram, which therefore I like very much, uh, showing that for different rates of growth in the economy uh, and different kinds of climate outcomes, there are a range of possible damages per ton of carbon here shown in $2,007. But you see that all these distributions have this big one fat tail, and somewhere around there at the end of the fat tail is the infinite cost of everybody dying. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult to, to really uh, 
assess what it's worth to mitigate carbon dioxide emissions for that reason. But, you know, everybody wants a number, so numbers and tables. You can kind of take the average and the median of the whatever and you get forty dollars a ton. Thirty-eight gigatons a year at forty dollars a ton is a cost of about one and a half trillion dollars a year, about two percent of global GDP. Now we find it very difficult to deal with slow moving emergencies of its nature. And I just want to give you an example of a successful uh, response. London became the world's largest city in 1821. And there were 1.4 million people there. And uh, unlike Rome, they had no central sewage disposal at that time. So people either threw their poop in the street or they had cisterns neighborhood. And they moved gradually over a pretty major threshold. They had three large cholera outbreaks in the first half of the 19th century that killed tens of thousands of people. And in one of the first uh, successes of epidemiology, people gradually came to realize that the cholera outbreaks were centered around these uh, cesspools. Uh, but still nothing much was done until 1858. It didn't rain much in London that summer. and. Uh, this period known as the Great Stink. The Royal Court moved out, Parliament debated moving out of London, but instead uh, they passed legislation, and over the next uh, decade they dug up all the streets in the world's largest city and installed a central sewage uh, removal network. And it cost about 2% of GDP over that decade, and uh, now it's cost about 1% of GDP in London to maintain that. So, you know, uh, to a certain extent, when we think that putting CO2 in the air is like putting poop in the street, then 2% of GDP will seem easily affordable. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. And so what if we do nothing? Uh, so there's various ideas out there which are both encouraging and um, potentially counterproductive, which uh, would seem to offer a route to removing carbon dioxide from the air should we exceed some threshold and want to come back. And so one idea is to have air capture various kinds of membranes fed by the wind or various kinds of pressurized air that take CO2 directly out of the air and put it somewhere and give it to someone. Uh, or, and then, you know, so I'll just mention my research a little bit. We've been very interested in natural reactions between air and surface water in these rocks from the Earth's interior, uh, where you know, it's a relatively rapid reaction that forms these solid carbonate minerals. They take CO2 out of the air and surface water. So, carbonates. Some, it's a system that, as you can see, breaks the rock for you. Uh, it uses natural geothermal heat. Uh, and so you could imagine uh, designing a system that emulates that natural system but accelerates it by a factor of 100,000 or a million and can gradually scrub carbon out of seawater and then return that carbon fluid seawater to the sea surface where it takes uh, CO2 out of the air. Now, this is very much in the R of R&D, and uh, you shouldn't uh, go out and invest in our company, which doesn't exist. But, uh, but, you know, it just it might be the cheapest way because it uses natural chemical potential energy that's just available and natural geothermal energy that's just available and uh, avoids grinding costs and CO2 transportation. So it might be. So there's this NRC report on climate intervention, just to bring everybody back to uh, kind of reality here, uh, that just came out. Um, and they want to point out to you that if you, buy, if you pass the safe limit of CO2 in the atmosphere by 100 ppm, uh, and you want to go back, that requires removing about 1,800 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere ocean system. Because as you take it out of the air, the ocean so 1,800 gigatons of CO2, let's say at $40 a ton, is $72 trillion, is roughly almost equal to present-day GDP. 
So that's really a lot. If we could amortize that cost over 20 years, it starts to be in the same scale as building the sewers in London. But I really think it's almost impossible to imagine people getting organized to do that over two decades on a global scale. And if the price turned out to be $400 a ton. <coughs> so, okay, there are other sources of energy, renewable, solar energy is orders of magnitude larger than projected global uh, consumption, just for example. Uh, and uh, these sources of energy generation are growing at unbelievable rates. Wind at about 24% a year, solar at about 37% per year. Here's global energy consumption up here. It's two orders of magnitude away. It seems very unrealistic to imagine that these growth rates can continue to accommodate tens of percent of global energy generation. And I always used to say in my classes that the challenge of energy storage from these intermittent sources that are far from demand sites and aren't synchronized with demand is going to cause these trends to dramatically decline. But having done the math, in the course of reviewing this NRC report, <coughs> I now tell students energy storage is a big challenge, but it's not as big a challenge as taking 100 ppm CO2 out of the air. And really, uh, I hope that a lot of the young people in this room will start to dedicate themselves to making sure that these trends continue. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. <coughs> Water management systems really to deal with like um, uh, with health 
health issues. And so you see this progressive segregation of natural ecologies off the island of Manhattan uh, over the course of 400 year history. Um, uh, not surprisingly, by the way, they did look at Sandy, and uh, I was uh, teased one of my uh, partners who, who uh, uh, lives uh, right there. Um, the flooding was exactly to uh, where the original uh, nature uh, edge of the island was. Uh, and you can actually see that. Um, there's a great map from 1865. This is a VA's um, uh, sanitary and uh, sewer map. Um, and it basically overlays the natural, original topography of, of Lower Manhattan, actually the whole island of Manhattan, um, with the grid, street grid, and the, uh, the commissioner's plan of 1811. And so I always find this is incredibly interesting because, of course, you think of Canal Street and being a life is only or you understand. Uh, one, you can see exactly where the flooding was during Sandy. And it's a of that. And actually, so much so that um, you know, architecture and buildings, and when we work with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, geotechnical engineers who do the foundations for it, because they actually still consult this map when you're initially looking at a building, saying, oh, okay, it's near where a uh, uh, underground stream is. And so we were interested as we were starting to work at this, we basically started to deposit, is there a way to sort of reconceive of the relationship of ecology and infrastructure within the city? Is there a way to sort of shift the paradigm of how we think of it as a designer? So one of the nice things about Having this, uh, designing this project for MoMA, that was a quick, that was a 10 week sort of intense burst of thinking through based on the earlier work we had done, is that it allows us, one, to almost purposely put blinders on to some of the realities that I know from working in the city, uh, the 14 to 20 different uh, um, uh, agencies that you have to deal with if you're working right in here from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, um, from the Army Corps of Engineers to a New York City planning uh, plan. Um, so really we try to frame what are the challenges that we're trying to set forward uh, for. There was a couple of them. One is sea level rise. Um, this being a theoretical project and, and architecture and urban design is actually framed by a series of over its history of theoretical projects and how to frame issues and then you design towards that uh, with real projects afterwards. Framing it towards how do you deal strengthen the edge for extreme sea level rise over 100 years, worst, worst case scenario, thinking that the value of lower Manhattan and that you designed for the worst. How do you deal with uh, category two storm surge inundation, which with the Army Corps of Engineers and the modeling that uh, um, uh, some of the scientists at Princeton have done, the worst case scenario of a category two storm, which is uh, basically occurs much more frequently, will occur more frequently over the next 50 to 100 years um, will increase. That's an 18 to 24 foot storm surge. Sandy was, I think, 13.5 feet, just under 14 feet. So, what's the worst case for that? Where does that go? Again, very close to the original edge of uh, Lower Manhattan. And then, parallel to that, actually looking at a different issue that uh, <coughs> designers within the city know of, which is something called CSOs, combined, combined sewer outflows. New York City has a a very old uh, sewer system. Um, and in essence, newer sewer systems segregate rainwater, stormwater, and sewage. Um, older systems use the same, uh, the same pipes, in essence. When there's rain, that system overflows, and they come out in these exact places around Lower Manhattan and around 450 points around New York City. To the tune of, in 2010, the number was 500 million gallons of effluent per week. I think 27 billion per year uh, coming up. Uh, and that's a little as a quarter inch of rain will overflow the system. So we really said, okay, let's look at this as a water management system, not just as a climate change, but how do you start to look at infrastructure in, in a way that can deal with this? And uh, in essence, can we sort of reframe how we think about that as a mode to um, look at urban design within, uh, within the city? Um, so we did that by two uh, uh, really on a project into two parts. One part was a, uh, a porous green street system that basically went up roughly to the storm surge area. And that had a series of different types of streets. Some of them just very simply absorptive. Other ones uh, that channel water back out in the event of storm surge. Um, and we worked through a series of these in, this is a little light, so you can't quite see the low, it's saying, okay, can we look at the city and really think of this project as the ground plane in below? We don't care what happens above us. Uh, uh, architecture, urban 
design can use to reframe the idea of the ground in New York City. And we basically said, let's take the existing infrastructure and in a fit of optimism, uh, say you can rationalize what's there. If you've ever uh, walked in lower Manhattan or in New York City, you've seen what the tear the street open. And say, can you take the systems that are there and segregate it to either side to, um, and under the sidewalk in a series of vaults that are protected? Um, and you'll see uh, uh, city planning and uh, building codes even the last two or three years are shifting in how this is dealt with anyway to deal with storm surge. And then can you put in a new, basically, series of engineered soils that are absorptive that deal with both rainwater or channel water off in a way that basically is creating um, a different infrastructure that works in parallel with the existing city infrastructure. And we look through that in a variety of systems working with some uh, several engineers and, and relatively lightly, I would add, so don't look too closely on, on sizing, but working through how that would work and then how that would deal with specific infrastructure uh, pieces. We also had the, um, uh, decided to make the assumption when you're looking at 650 acres, which is an area of lower Manhattan that we're looking at, at 650 acres, you do a calculation of when it rains, how much absorptive area do you need uh, to absorb rainfall or how much absorptive area do uh, you need in terms of storm surge to process certain amounts of water. Um, in this case, for rainfall, you need around 80 acres. Uh, we, we took up a large amount of parking and decided eventually congestion pricing will come through. You have a large area that you can deal with. We just put aside um, some issues of fire trucks and other things that we know about. Um, and basically, can you balance and set up a system that deals with at least rainwater in a straightforward way um, that then processes that uh, and also using a series of plants where you can fight over and mediate some of the pollution and some of the pollutants that hit in the water um, uh, through, uh, through the system. And we work through that in a variety of different ways, both on the, um, uh, within the street system and also on the converse side, areas to store water in times of drought um, uh, to sort of look at a sort of total system of management of the water within the island and along then the edge uh, of the island, the second system that was really a layer of uh, productive uh, park, which are absorptive, and then a series of fresh water and, and salt water um, uh, uh, estuaries that would basically filter water coming off. And then in a um, partial way, though not, not certainly not in a full way, help mitigate some of the effects of storm surge. There's two issues with storm surge. One is uh, the issue of the water itself. The other is the issue of the force of the water. Um, so when you model and you have a direct hit specifically at the, at the tip, the, the force of the water itself and city planning actually has a series of scenarios. They're worried about broken glass, for example. Issues, secondary issues you don't think of when you have very strong storm surge. Uh, one of the things, and classically one of the reasons uh, Katrina was so bad, is the undermining of the wetland areas around that basically used to absorb the force of storm surge. It gets torn up and then it grows over the next 15 or 20 years. So this really acts in two ways, uh, or really three ways. One is an absorptive system for rainwater as it comes off and it basically filters that. Two as as helping deal with storm surge, and specifically at the tip with some bioengineering islands using sort of geotextile tubes, and that's where you get the direct hit from the modeling that we saw. And then three, trying to create sort of a consistent um, ecosystem uh, that's connected around the island. In some areas, we were growing the island more for um, and we did some initial uh, calculations of how much land you need to add. Other areas we actually had to carve in because the uh, island's been added to so much, the bathymetry uh, on the west side drops off so deeply that you can't get a proper ecosystem. So we basically carved in a uh, parallel to this island. We were doing a project for Goldman Sachs. We carefully avoided that new building. Um, uh, but uh, uh, you, the value of that, um, obviously, is a whole other. Uh, discussion, but in order to make it work in terms of the productive ecosystem, that's how you work. It's different on, on the East River, and uh, basically the geomorphology is different. We were adding on to it. And again, this is uh, looked at in two different ways. This is looked at as a conceptual project of how you reframe um, and sort of pull back in the uh, um, uh, sort of overview of this. Can you start to think about uh, urban planning or design where ecology is really part of the infrastructure. Can you productively design that into the systems? Can you look at new ways of dealing with that ecosystem? Um, 
probably over the past two or three years, I've come uh, on the board of something called the Van Allen Institute that looks at public projects. We're looking at a, a engineering competition down the lower uh, Mississippi River, dealing with some issues. That. Of course, you look at the lower Mississippi and maybe 100 and uh, trying to remember the year he's redesigned the end of the Mississippi to deal with silk, dump it off the cell. There was this incredibly intelligent engineering system to deal with the problem with massive negative consequences. So on the one hand, uh, it's easy to put this forward. I think actually conceptually trying to reframe how you think about urban design and infrastructure uh, makes a lot of sense. How to actually and push that forward in a productive way is then the challenge that, that we have as, as urban designers and engineers and civil engineers.
Specifically, Peter talked about the loss of value of um, the fossil fuel industry. We stopped using fossil fuels. That's already happened. And the coal industry, the entire coal industry in the United States today, has a market value of about $30 billion. That sounds like a lot of money to you, but it's not. And Mr. Bloomberg could buy that with a small change. Apple has cash reserves of several hundred billion dollars. Uh, so $30 billion is small change. And this market value has come down enormously in the last decade. Why? Because people are aware that you know, coal is the most environmentally harmful of all fuels, and eventually it's going to get phased out. Uh, so investing in coal is seen as a full step. And that's not because, again, that's not because of environmental considerations, it's just because of Michael Real policy. Um, so the, the big problem with widespread adoption of renewable energy, as Peter indicated, obviously, is energy storage. And it's intermittent, there can be times when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, and if you're relying on renewable energy, you're stuck. So you need to be able to store energy. And the way we handle that problem today is to use some other source of power as a backup. And the, the ones widely used are either hydropower, which you can switch on and off the shoulders, or natural gas turbines, which you can also switch on and off the shoulders, which are very cheap to build. So most utilities that have a lot of wind or a lot of solar today also have a lot of natural gas um, to sort of back, use that as a backup for when the wind drops or the sun goes. Um, and that's actually not too bad in my kind of perspective because natural gas produces something like a third to a half of the CO2 per kilowatt hour of power generated that coal does. Um, it produces about half the CO2 that coal does in the US, about a third of the CO2 that coal does in China for power stations all over the world. Um, so anyway, that would be, you know, we, we, we need, ideally we'd like to get rid of the natural gas as a fuel source too, but for that we need to be able to store electric power. You know, we all do that every day in batteries. You know, myself over here has some lithium ion batteries in it. And that's a, that's a small scale storage gets quite efficient, but the large scale storage gets kind of expensive. But you know, quite interesting thing is that the, the single area into which most venture capital money is going in the US today, and has been for several years now, is energy storage. And I could list probably 14 or 15 companies that have been founded in the last couple of years uh, in the energy storage field, all funded by, uh, by venture capital. And if even one of them happens to, sort of, to succeed, it could solve the sort of problem of energy storage fields. So anyway, that's you know, some mildly good news on the, uh, on the climate front. And there are technologies out there which don't use fossil fuels. Uh, we couldn't use them 100% today because of the intermittency issue. But you know, within 10 years or 15 years, I'm optimistic enough to think there will be effective ways of storing electric power. Uh, and if we can do that, we can actually go completely away from fossil fuels. And the interesting thing about these technologies, as I said, is they're inexpensive. So it would not necessarily lead to an increase in the cost of electric power. Uh, in fact, using wind and using solar today doesn't usually is associated with a drop rather than an increase in the cost of electric power. Uh, so that's just some comments uh, from you know, previous remarks, uh, just like following up on what he said from an economic perspective rather than a, a scientific perspective. Um, let me get back to the issue, or get to the issue of natural capital, which is what I guess we're here to talk about. Um, when I talk about natural capital, uh, I'd like to start off by quoting a Republican president. It's kind of a weird thing to do in the area of environment and sustainability. Uh, and uh, um, I'll quote this guy. I quote him with approval, too. That's the really funny thing. Quote him with Republican president. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read you the quote and see if anybody can place it. So the quote is, the nation behaves well if it treats natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. Who said that, guys? Which Republican president said that? Um, Nixon, maybe? A hundred years ago? A hundred years ago. Teddy Roosevelt. Great. Yeah, that was Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, I mean, if you actually think interested, you know, the politics of this is weird. Uh, if you look at the environmental groups and their websites, many of them have some sort of ranking of presidents by their environment, how environmental they were. And, you know, there's this three that always stand out as being the most pro-environmental presidents, and two of them are Republicans. Isn't that weird? Uh, at least today, anyway. Um, and they were obviously Roosevelt and Nixon. Uh, and then the third is Johnson. And pretty much every piece of environmental legislation we have today was laid down under Nixon and Johnson. Uh, you know, probably his first film on the uh, Johnson and then revised on the Nixon. The only significant environmental legislation we've had since Nixon was George H.W. Bush's 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act. Democratic presidents unfortunately have not been listened to, except possibly the current those by line. 
to face by legal challenge and so on. That would be very important to me. Anyway, um, the point about that, that, that uh, Roosevelt concept, that quote, the history of the Tea Party again, he says, natural resources are assets to turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. So here's the concept of natural capital culture. And he's seeing the environment as an asset, and he's seeing it important for society to invest in the environment. That's what he means by increasing not impairing value. Right? So, so Roosevelt, 100 plus years ago, was already saying we need to see the environment as an asset, uh, and we need to invest in this asset. Um, <clears throat> now, let's just talk about the concept of capital for a second. From an economic perspective, capital is something that generates a flow of services over time. So this building is a capital asset, provides a flow of services over time. Your PC is a capital asset, they provide flows of services over some short periods of time. So the environment is an asset in that sense too. The environment provides a lot of services which are very important to us. Uh, well, ecology system, wildness, or ecosystem services. And it provides those services obviously over time. Uh, interestingly, it provides them over a very, very long period of time. You know, the Hudson River here uh, has been providing services of various types to human beings ever since they've been, uh, which is several thousand years ago, or 10,000 years ago. Uh, and we'll continue to be on the same scale in the future too. Uh, so environmental assets typically don't depreciate, but hopefully long of it, which makes it in some respects a very good value. Um, what's the value of an environmental asset? Well, the value of any capital asset is just what we call the present discounted value of the flow of future services for the use. That's the MBA capital corporate finance 101. Um, so if you want to value an environmental asset, you just find the value, find the flow of services it's going to produce place some kind of dollar value on that, and then take the present value. Um, what are examples, you know, give you some concrete examples of the environment as assets, as economically important assets, and give you some values for them. So, um, we'll be talking about electricity. Uh, about 10% of the US's electric power comes from hydroelectricity. So that's rivers as capital assets. There are plenty of hydropower stations in the US to produce power in the range of one to two gigawatts. Um, if you wanted to build a coal-fired power station or a nuclear power station producing one to two gigawatts of output, uh, then you have to spend roughly three to eight billion dollars. So a, a river with a dam on it that produces a couple of gigawatts of power uh, has to essentially as a, it's equivalent to a, a, a conventional physical asset, built asset, which might cost you five to ten billion dollars. So that's an example of uh, uh, a sort of an uh, environmental asset that has enormous economic value in a very condensed sense. And countries like Norway and Sweden, for example, get 90% of their electricity from hydropower. Um, and in one reason, they're so prosperous, actually. They're so clean and so prosperous, they get almost all of their power essentially free. And the marginal cost of the operating cost of a hydropower station is zero, not at all. And it's totally non pollutant um, so uh, that's an example of, a, of, a, of a, you know, the environment as a capital asset. A rather different one is pollinating insects. A lot of publicity on bees in the last few years. The fact that bees are dying out. Well, roughly a third of all the food that you eat uh, has to be pollinated before, before the plants bear fruit. So um, you can actually watch a couple of German scientists did a few years back in a article science was. We'll sit down and work out um, what would happen to the value of food production if the pollinating insects in the world all died out. So how much value would we lose? What value are they? What's the value of the food that depends on pollination processes? Um, and from that you can get some sense of, you know, you can get a, at least a partial value for the insect population in the world. And I just took that number and said, what's the capital value of an asset that yields a flow of services like that? And the answer was $14 trillion. So the insect population of the world, according to these calculations, is worth $14 trillion. There's a number that's up there with the one that Peter was talking about. And that's, that's a partial value, because there were a bunch of things they left out. That's a partial value of the, uh, of the services provided by insects. You know, these are tiny things that big, but they can actually be extraordinary value. Um, the other thing which I think is interesting, and this is relevant in the climate context, is uh, forests. You know, forests provide a lot of services to humans. They suck up CO2 from the atmosphere as they grow, and they release oxygen in the atmosphere. A lot of the oxygen we're breathing right now comes from forests. Absent forests and uh, plants would probably be something. Uh, so forests are very important to us. 
Um, I don't know how to value the oxygen that they produce. There isn't a market in oxygen. Um, and there's probably more oxygen than the need to its market price might be zero if there were one. Uh, but the, we can certainly put some, do some estimate of the cost of CO2, the value of the CO2 that they absorb. Um, you know, Peter again gave us some numbers, the US government's official numbers for the, the social cost of carbon. Most of those numbers, in my opinion, as an economist, on the low side, uh, for a bunch of systematic reasons, which, which I don't think the authors of that report would disagree, actually. Um, and, uh, but if you take the US government's uh, official figures for the social cost of carbon, uh, which are very conservative ones, I believe, and then you value the services that the world's forests provide, uh, you know, in terms of soaking up CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, the answer that you get for the value of the forest is somewhere in the region again of $15 trillion. So insects are worth $14 trillion, forests are worth $15 to $20 trillion. And these are obviously big numbers. Uh, they're comparable to the values of, you know, uh, actually probably much bigger than the values of the capital of fossil fuel. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, natural capital is important economically. Uh, you can value at least some aspects of it, but the values you get are absolutely enormous. It's, it's very important. Um, so we go back to a question which Peter raised actually, which is given that these things have enormous value, why are we destroying them? Why is it that we're letting the population of pollinating insects die out? Why are we destroying forests at an unbelievable rate? Uh, and rain bother asset natural capital assets. Um, that's not an easy question to answer. And part of the answer is that much of these values, many of these values aren't actually captured by the market. So, for example, if I own a forest, um, the forest you know, provides services to the public as a whole by soaking up carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, releasing oxygen. But I, as the owner, don't get paid for that. Right? If I own a forest, the only way I can make money out of it is to cut it down and sell it. There's actually, at this point in time, no other way of deriving cash from forests. Okay? Now, they were trying to change that, and I, I was in the introduction, as mentioned, I might share the board of a group called the Coalition of Rainforest Nations. And our, our agenda for the last 10 years has been to try to persuade the world to pay the countries for conserving their forests. So I'll throw a system called RED, R-E-D-D, -D, which does not feel familiar with the UNFCCC or the um, The idea behind that is just to recognize the fact that forests provide valuable services uh, and that the people who own them should be compensated for those services rather than having to try to get cash from them by cutting them down. Um, it's you know, rather like uh, you know, the situation of a forest in the day, rather like the situation of a building on them can't rent his building. You can only get cash out of it by selling bits and pieces of it, you know, knocking it down, selling the components, selling the bricks, and so on. Um, so, and actually, you know, there's the campaign to get uh, countries paid for the uh, carbon capture and storage role that their forests pay has had some success. So, the, you know, the Brazilian government has recently paid a billion dollars uh, under this, this fund uh, to reduce the rates of deforestation. And it actually has reduced the rates of deforestation. Uh, and there's some negotiations going on with several other heavily forested countries to try to reduce their rates of deforestation in exchange for a comparable payment. So there's about six or seven billion dollars available at this point uh, for compensating countries uh, for reducing rates of deforestation. Um, so that's, you know, that's one way of, of, of trying to change the incentives uh, and, and, and provide people with some incentive to conserve natural capital. Um, now forests are actually relatively easy, unfortunately. You can see I mean, there's an obvious role for uh, the, the carbon cap, almost value to the carbon capital and storage role, and uh, we can try to catch, try to, to pay people. Um, there are actually plenty of other ways of dealing with these issues. Um, I think I'm going to try to wrap up reasonably quickly at this point. But um, you know, there are, the, the economics textbooks have a wide range of mechanisms of trying to capture the market value of, of some of these, these uh, ecosystem services, natural capital services, you can do regulations, you can do it by what we call Pagodian taxes and subsidies, uh, you can do it by sort of ingenious interventions like this red idea, uh, you can do it by establishing ownership rights, for example, with systems of uh, some tradable fisheries permits or ways of establishing ownership rights in common property resources. Um, and more recently, you know, there are lots of other things that have been devised. For example, I mean, the most uh, the things I'm talking about in my MBA course in this area is uh, consumer activism. And the US consumers 
who decide not to consume things that produce in environmentally harmful fashions. If you decide you want to consume rainforest coffee rather than regular coffee, if you decide that you want to consume, don't want to consume goods that contain palm oil, or you don't want to consume goods that contain palm oil that's been produced on, on land which can be and you have a new range of options available to you. On my iPhone here, I have what called the Good Guide. And if I open that guide up and scan a barcode on a good name in a supermarket, it tells me whether it's environmentally harmful or whether it's socially harmful. It gives me a rating on environmental and social grounds. And I'd recommend that you use it. Um, and if everybody used devices like that, it would actually put pressure on companies uh, to reform their supply chains and to try to make them more environmentally beneficial uh, than they might today. So that's, that's a mechanism which is not part of the standard textual approaches. Same thing happens on the investment side too. As investors, all of you who have pension funds are investors on some scale, you can go to like. Um, then, you know, as investors, you can also put pressure in the sort of way. And all the divestment debate that's going on among university campuses right now is about this. You know, should universities use their pressure as investors uh, with significant but not massive portfolios uh, to try to achieve ends to the stock market rather than to the ballot? So, Economist magazine, though, has been a series of articles about that, which was called Shocking Your Values. They talk about consumers who are trying to bring about social and environmental change by using the shopping cart rather than the ballot box. Uh, and I think you know, this is a, partly a function of frustration with the political system and inability to achieve that end in this end in this area of the political system. But it's also, I think, a, a way of exploiting leverage which has been unexplored in the past, which can prove more powerful. Um, so I think there's lots of ways in which we can use some of these things. Um, the biggest problem, I think, really is, is making sure that the general public is aware of these issues. Uh, you know, there's so much noise out there, so much competition for people's attention, but it's hard to get these issues on the public's agenda. If you can get them on the public's agenda, we can solve the problems. We know how to solve them. We know how to solve them economically. We have technologies which we're going to to solve them too. Uh, so the fact that we're not solving them doesn't mean that we don't know how to. Uh, it just means that we're not being able to get them on the agenda appropriately. And um, I guess that's ultimately a matter of political will. It's something that, you know, Academics have to work on to publicize these issues. NGOs have to work on. NGOs play a very important role in, uh, in kind of bringing these things to the public agenda and getting them on the political agenda. That's why I spent a lot of my time on the halls of NGOs trying to steer them in this direction. Um, so I think, you know, I think this might give you a, a positive spin on this at the end. Um, I'm saying that we know how to solve these problems. There's nothing that you've heard of today that isn't soluble. Um, you know, to solve them technically, you know, to solve them politically, you know, so economically. Uh, just a question of getting the political will. And that's not true. Uh, you know, for example, the fossil fuel industry is enormously cash rich. Uh, you know, oil is being sold today at a price of $50 a barrel. It's a low price historically. Guess what? It costs $10, 15 a barrel to produce. It's a huge amount of cash that industry generates. And all that's available for the political body. You can buy a lot of politicians that sort of money. And they do. Uh, put it very bluntly. Um, so, you know, you've got a, a formidable political mechanism to, to, to overcome. You want to get this into the agenda and get action on them. But if you get that, if you achieve that, uh, then you know, the problem can be solved within a couple of decades. I'll leave them on that.